Hey, Abnormal Investigations. Um, I got a story coming in from Kentucky. I must give you a uh, content warning at the beginning of the story. It's uh, a little crazy. So, um, again, a content warning. Let's get into it. Mike, I live in a town in Kentucky. It's in the Appalachian Mountains. I'm not going to give the location just for the safety of myself. Many still might recognize who I am. In my little town, we had a man that had mental issues. He used to work on lawnmowers, weed eaters, and small engines, and he was quite the pro at it. He had fixed everybody's at least once or twice in town, and it's how he got by. He never caused any trouble. He was always just a pleasure to meet and a pleasure to talk to. Always giving people breaks on their lawnmower work. I went out one night. And I was hunting squirrel. It was late evening. And my squirrel hunt turned into hunting coons. And while I was out coon hunting, Mike, there was an old bridge that used to run across the creek. Now this old bridge was what some people call an old suspension bridge. It had the large cables that ran across, it held it up, it had the large overhead, you know, steel beams. And it had the old railroad ties that went across that you had to keep your tires on the planks or risk falling through the bridge. Now this old bridge, it wasn't hardly used anymore. A couple of farmers that lived on the other side of it would use it to get back and forth, but other than that, it wasn't a highly traveled road anymore. I was working my way up the bank, trying to make my way to the bridge, which I would use as a shortcut to cross to get back to my truck to head home. I was probably a hundred yards from the bridge when I heard the god awfulest commotion. I heard a man screaming, and it sounded like another man screaming and then a dog attacking. I picked my rifle and I ran. It must have been about 10, 10, 30 at night. It was dark. Here I am running through the woods with my headlamp on, with my little 22 in my hand, trying to make it to whoever's being attacked. Whenever I finally make it to the top of the bridge, I can look down across the creek, which is a pretty good drop, and I see a man on the other side of the bank. It appears he's fighting another man. Until I noticed this other man was huge. I'm talking bigger than any man I've ever seen. But the bad thing was there was three. And they were all the same size. One would pick the man up. And throw him to the ground like you would a pillow when you were playing in your bed. The other one would pick him up almost as fast as he would hit and then slam him again. Then one would jump on him, like just jump straight onto him and then jump off of him. And then another one would jump up with both hands, come down and just crack the man in the back. You could hear all this going on. It was terrible. I was afraid, I'm not going to lie. I knew that if they were killing him, that they'd probably have no problem killing me. And here I am, all I had was a twenty-two single shot. or three of them. I loaded a bullet into my gun. I couldn't help but to try to at least do the right thing. And I shot into the air. And then I hid, hoping to scare them away. And they did. They ran into the woods. I ran down beside the creek, as close to the creek as I could get because I had been around it. I slid down the side into a real thick bunch of bushes. It was perfect. They stopped me from entering the water. But I was hidden in a good spot. 
I heard walking around me. They were up above me, but I could hear them walking. They were looking for me. I stayed as quiet as I could, my stomach so sick. I didn't know if I was going to be able to keep from vomiting. Mike, I could hear these things. They were breathing, and they were moving every bush. You could hear them pulling the bushes back, looking. And finally, one of them makes a weird noise. He makes like a like a puppy that growls and kind of like a snapping sound. And I hear him walking away. And then one of the things, Mike, that I will never forget as long as I live, I heard him on the bridge. And whenever I looked up to the bridge, I seen him standing there. I seen him lift a body up over its head and throw the body off the bridge down into the water. They walked off back into the woods in the area they came from where this battle had happened. I stayed quiet, Mike. I wasn't going to move at all. I was so scared. I was so afraid they would see me and I'd be the next one in the water. I saw the body float past me. There was a slight current. And then they returned back to the bridge. I dared not to move. I was so afraid. I was crying, not loudly, but tears. And I hear more splashes. And then one of them turns his head in the moonlight and I noticed he had a snout. Tall ears, pointed ears. And I thought to myself, what the F is this? These are not people. They dropped all fours and ran into the woods. I later stayed in that bush until daylight. And I finally returned home the next day to hear the news. Charlie had been found in the river. They found his tackle box, fishing pole, and everything. They said it looked like Charlie had fell off the bridge and hit a few of the poles on his way down. I knew better, but I was afraid to say anything. Finally, I got my guts up and I went to the district attorney and I told them what had happened. They made it clear to me that if I said that it was anything weird, that it wouldn't be good for me. Well, the family kept pushing and pushing because they didn't believe that he had fell from the bridge because of the way the injuries were. And they hired some guy from out of town. He was a mortician that, well, he found things that just didn't add up. He had large gashes on him, scrapes on him. He had punctures like he'd been just beat to death. And he said he believed that something had done it. He didn't say it was a human, but he didn't say it was an animal. And the family assumed that he was beat to death by a bunch of people. Later on, the old boy that worked on the lawnmowers, they arrested him and charged him for the murder. He was sentenced to be executed. I knew he didn't do it, and a lot of people knew that he didn't do it, but it didn't matter. They had their eyes set on getting rid of the problem and, well, finding a solution to the problem, and the solution was finding the killer. About three days later, he was sent off out of town to a state penitentiary to await his execution. Everything had calmed down in our town for a while. It was almost six months. Until one day, they started bringing in a man that farmed on the outside of town, screaming and hollering and covered in blood. They drug him into the jail, where he was locked up, and the sheriff was telling everyone that he had went out and ran his daughter over on the tractor with the brush hog. Pretty much mutilated her. Slung her up into the trees and everything. Said it was a horrific sight. He was screaming he did not do it. He was screaming that he hadn't even ran the tractor. That he had found his daughter like that. 
the sheriff wouldn't have it. But the weird thing is, Mike, they had the money to hire detectives from another town, from the big city. And when they came in, they determined that his daughter was not killed by the tractor. That his daughter was killed by a wolf with altered DNA because they found human DNA in the wolf DNA. You think this wasn't a hush-hush deal? They turned it over to the family and the judge, of course, offered the family a deal. No one knows exactly what the deal was, but we were told it was a lump sum of money from the government and that they would never have to pay taxes on their feed or their land again. Now we can't prove it, but that's what a lot of people that was working on the inside said had happened that day. These things are out there. They will hunt you down. People in your government know they're there. Even if you're in a small town with a small judge and a small police force. And they will do whatever it takes to hide these things, Mike. I don't hunt no more. I don't fish no more. I don't care to ever run onto one of these things. I know they're still down in there. Why they don't hunt us as much as people think they should, I don't know. But I do know after we had all the deaths, they built watchtowers and they called them ranger towers to watch for forest fires. But the rangers would use them a lot and you would hear gunshots from them. They were only practicing, they would say. But it's funny, when the towers went up and all the practicing started, the murder stopped. It may not be nothing, and it may be everything, Mike, but I wanted to share this story with you. Thank you for posting my story if you decide to. Every bit of it's true. And I wanted to tell it before someday I'm gone and the story goes with me. In the hills of Kentucky, Mike, there's a lot of evil. And it's not just dog men. Ask anybody that lives up here. That's an amazing story. That's scary. Um, thank you for sharing that and sending that in. That's wild. Um, I really don't know what to say. Um, I would say that the man on the, on the creek that was killed, I think he said his name was Charlie, uh, it was an opportunity for him. He was alone on a creek bank. I mean, when you're alone like that in the middle of nowhere, they're opportunists. He was at the wrong place, and it sounds like a pack of them, or a family of them, whatever you want to call it, ran onto him. Be careful, guys, if you're out in the woods alone. You might just find something down there that might just beat you to death, or maul you to death, and then make it look like a simple drowning. And what's bad is, well, the police may even agree that it was a drowning. Thanks for watching, guys. Keep your head on a swivel, and until next time, don't be something's dinner. And be safe out there.